want you to open your Bibles this morning to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 29, we're going to read one verse. And beloved, as several weeks ago, as I was praying, the Lord gave me this message. And I, I really didn't want to preach it, to be honest with you. Uh, but it's needful. But then I got a call from a pastor. And he was commenting on one of the sermons that he's seen, as I guess, on YouTube. And it confirmed that this is what the Lord wanted me to preach. And my message is entitled, Crossing God's Death Line. Not Deadline, Death Line. Crossing God's Death Line. Now, beloved, this is important that every one of us hear this. Those who are here today, it's not by accident. God providentially brought you here. Those watching by television, God providentially brought you there. Those who are watching on YouTube, God has providentially guided you to see this. Now, the important thing is that we open our hearts and hear what God has to say unto the churches. Amen? Proverbs chapter 29, verse number 1. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. The message is entitled, Crossing God's Death Line. I want you to read Proverbs 29, 1 with me. We all set? Let's begin. He that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. He that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Sounds pretty serious, doesn't it? Our Father and our God, as we study the Word of God this morning, as we delve into it, Father, we're praying that the resident teacher, the indwelling Holy Spirit, the blessed illuminator, Open up the eyes of our understanding, Lord. Take away our preconceived notions. Lord, give us the humility of heart to be able to receive this. And Father, I pray that you touch me, give, uh, strengthen my flesh, and Father, uh, strengthen my spirit that I can preach this in the right spirit to bring glory and honor and praise unto thy name and build up the faith of your people. We ask it in Christ our Savior's name. Amen. And you may be seated. Well, i got a question I want to start off with. I want you to listen to this, and I want you to answer it. If you know the Word of God, I think you'll know exactly what I'm saying. My question is this. Is it possible for an impenitent sinner, a non-Christian, an impenitent sinner, is it possible for an impenitent, backslidden Christian to ever pass the point of no return with God? Is it possible to ever pass the point of no return with God? Now, beloved some three times in Romans chapter 1, the Bible says, Paul speaking to the churches of Rome, said this, And God gave them up. And God gave them up. And God gave them over to their own reprobate mind. You don't ever want that to happen because you don't ever want God stopping working in your life. Would you say amen out there? I'm saying this, beloved, can folks like this who so willfully who so obstinately, who so stubbornly and arrogantly reject all of God the Holy Spirit's overtures and attempts to get them to repent of their sins, but adamantly refuses efforts, finally step over that red line and that dead line with God. Is that possible? Well, beloved, unfortunately, God draws a line in the sand of our life. Every person has a line in the sand of our life. And unfortunately, the unequivocal and biblical answer is yes, indeed. The scripture everywhere teaches that. It is, impossible, it is possible for God to stop working in a person's life because they just will not listen to what God has to say. No matter what God says, they still don't want to hear it. No matter who God says to them, they still don't want to hear it. So yes, indeed, it is possible. So the Bible tells us, he that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit hath to say unto the church. Amen? Now, Jesus said that in Revelation three time, uh, Revelations, uh, chapters 2 and 3. He said it three times. Anyone that has ears, let him hear what the Holy Spirit has to say unto the churches. That means me. That means you. That means every single person who names the name of Christ, every person who professes to know the name of Christ, let, he that has ears to hear, if you really will listen to what the Holy Spirit has to say, let him hear what the Holy Spirit is saying, especially to you today. What I'm saying is God will now forever take his hand off of them, beloved, and give them up and over 
uh, to the eternal consequences of their own impenitent sins, and now they'll be lost forever. Unfortunately, the Bible calls this the second death. They'll be lost in the burning, boiling, bubbling flames of a devil's hell, the lake of fire, the Bible says. And you know, God says he will rejoice in it because his justice will now be carried out. You know, we all think of God as mercy, right? But justice, oh, we don't want to talk about that with God, do we? But you see, beloved, the reason for that is because now they've crossed the death line uh, uh, in their life that God has drawn, and God will no more go back and start working with that person. And you cannot be saved. You cannot ever be saved through your own efforts. You have to have God, the Holy Spirit, working in your life to give you the faith, to give you the repentance, so you can humble yourself before God and come to know the Lord. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, when a person like this ultimately does that, God will no longer send the Holy Spirit to convict them. God will no longer bear with them in their sins and their folly. God will no longer pour out His grace and mercy on them to get them to repent. And God will no longer give them any more opportunities to be saved, to ever go to heaven. Excuse me, why? Why is that, Pastor? Because they've repeatedly and unconscionably, do you hear that? I didn't say unconsciously. I said unconscionably and callously have spurned his son's redemptive work on the cross, beloved, and they've trampled the sinless, shameless, guiltless, blameless, crimson blood underfoot. When a person rejects Jesus, beloved, or rejects God's reproof, what they're doing is taking God's blood and going like this to it. You can find that, by the way, in Hebrews chapter 10. They're trampling the blood of Christ underfoot. You know, the world, I was telling Dave, this is a hard life. It is, and it's even harder for the Christian who's trying to walk upright through through life, isn't it? But, beloved, you hear me now. The Bible says in the last days there will be a great apostasy. And I've told you for years and years and years, and blessed be God, it has come upon us right now. What we have is nominal Christianity. People say, I believe you, Jesus, but still want to do whatever they want to do in life. Don't bother me with the details. And that's sad. But why does God give them up, beloved? Because they shunned all of his attempts to recover them from the snare of the devil. And the Bible says from the cords of their sin that they get tangled up in. Tangled up emotionally. Tangled up physically. The cords of their sin, the scripture says. Why? Because, ladies and gentlemen, they have spurned and they have frustrated and they have exhausted the limits of God's mercy and God's grace by crossing his death line, beloved, that he's drawn for them in the sand of their life. And they've now irreversibly crossed that red line painted in the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, and it now becomes their death line. Now, Most people don't even want to think about that or think it's possible in their life. But you need to hear what I have to say uh, this morning and check me out, like I always tell you, and what the Scripture has to say. Amen? Keep me honest. Now, God now levels, when a person does this, a judicial indictment of condemnation upon them and forever leaves them alone because now he sees there's nothing more that his mercy or grace can do for them in their life. He's tried again and again and again and again, but they will not listen. Hey, listen to me now. I'm not just talking about an unsaved person here. I'm talking about an impenitent person. You may not be living out in the drunk, or drunk in the street, but you may have hardened your heart. And the Bible warns us about that. Harden not your heart. It says throughout the book of Hebrews, harden not your heart, harden not your heart. And we do. We harden our heart and it gets callous. Amen. So, beloved, what King Solomon is saying here, who was the wisest man on this earth, save the Lord Jesus Christ, is a very terrifying and frightening thought. But you say this to me, Pastor Joel, I thought God was God of love. I thought God was a God of mercy and grace. And I thought God was patient and long-suffering with us. Well, beloved, indeed he is. All of these things, uh, all of them are true. But these are not God's greatest attributes that is revealed by him in the word of God. Did you hear what I said? It may be in your mind. But it is not what God has revealed about himself in the word of God. And that's the important thing so we can, as we're reading that, we can check it out. Now, you're just selecting, people that say this, 
are just selecting the attributes of God that they've chosen because it can, they feel comfortable with it. It doesn't require them to change their lifestyle. And if they just think about the mercy and the grace of God and the long-suffering of God, you know, have no fear of experiencing his judgment. You know, beloved, it's so, because of our tactile senses, our eyes, our ears, our hands, the touch, smell, t- because of that, many times, it's hard for us to see the invisible, isn't it? The Bible says about Moses, Moses endured as seeing him who was invisible. Through the eye of faith, Moses was able to look down the corridors of time, and he was able to see, not, he didn't have a church, didn't have a Bible like we have, but he was able to see the promises of the coming of the Messiah. And so he endured. He forfeited everything, really. He left Egypt, the position that he had, second in command under Pharaoh, because he'd rather suffer affliction with the people of God than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, the Bible says. So we need to really make sure, beloved, that through the eye of faith, we realize that the things that God say are more real, and we can't see it, are more real than the things that we can see. Amen? I would love to listen to me. So the attributes that people say about his love and his mercy and his grace, beloved, are only part of the truth. They only focus on part of the truth. And when you callously focus on part of the truth and try to make it all of the truth about God, then you end up with a half-truth and untruth and a counterfeit position about God. Amen? So you don't ever want to do that. You see, beloved, the Bible reveals that God's greatest attributes are not His mercy, are not His love, are not His patience, are not His long-suffering. The Bible reveals that the greatest attributes of Almighty God are God's holiness. It is God's righteousness and justness. It is God's moral and spiritual purity, beloved. Oh, listen to me. God's love and mercy and grace will never do what His holiness and His righteousness and His justice condemns. That's expressly why Jesus had to come and die on the cross as our sacrifice, our substitute, and our sin bearer. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying this, that God could not pour out His love and mercy and grace upon us until His righteousness and His holiness and His justice was appeased on the cross of Jesus. He bore our penalty. He bore our sins. And every person that's walking on the top side of this earth has the judgment of God hanging over them like the proverbial sword of Damocles, whether they believe it or know it or not. Because otherwise you've got to deny what the Bible says and call God a liar. And the Bible says God cannot lie And I'll tell you what, I don't want to stand before God and say, you're a liar. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. Would you say amen out there? You know, beloved, there's an old Christian poem that speaks about one crossing God's death line in their life. And it says something like this. I was trying to remember it. It says, there's a time I know not when. There's a place I know not where that marks the destiny of men to heaven or despair. There's a line unseen by us that crosses our path. It's the hidden boundary between God's mercy and God's wrath. That's a profound poem, isn't it? There's a line that we can't see. And that's why the Bible constantly beckons us to come unto Him. Come unto Him. Beloved, listen to me. The greatest influence in my life has been God. The greatest Uh, example I look to is not my friends. I look to my God. And if my friends are wrong, I try to lovingly tell them they're wrong because that's my responsibility as a Christian, not only a pastor. Amen. So, beloved, crossing God's death line means this. It means that there's no more hope for that person ever again being saved. None. An unsaved man right now has access to the love and mercy and grace of God. God gives him food. God gives him clothing. God gives him a job. He gives him all these things. And yet, how many thank him? How many recognize him? How many praise him? And we know that Romans 2, 4 says it's the goodness of God that leads us under repentance. Amen? It's not God approving your life. It's God saying, listen, I may disapprove it, but I'm such a good God, I want to save you because this is the only heaven you'll ever know. The hell that you're going through right now. And it's nothing compared to what awaits that person afterwards. 
So, beloved, throughout this sermon, I want, to speak, I want to be speaking to all of us, but in particularly, now listen to me, I want to speak to the impenitent, unsaved people and impenitent backsliders, beloved, or professing Christians, nominal Christians, who say with their lips, I believe in you, Jesus, but they don't live it with their heart. They become hard-hearted. Because everybody today, I believe in Jesus. James 2.19, look it up. The Bible says the devils also believe and they tremble. At least the demons tremble. Do you? And I say you, that's an editorial you. That includes me too. At least the demons tremble at the fate that awaits them. They know what Jesus did on the cross. Colossians 2.15, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. That is the cross. He triumphed over them on the cross, and demons are real, and the battle is real. And a lot of Christians don't think about it. Out of sight, out of mind. And you know, Satan loves to lull us to sleep. When we're in problems, we're starting to think about God. When things are going right, we just kind of put them aside and... Beloved, you got it backwards. Well, there's four profound truths here that I want to speak to you, to you that's revealed in this frightening text. <clears throat> the first thing I want you to see, beloved, is the serial reproofs. And that's not serial with a C, okay? It's S-E-R-I-A-L. In other words, the repeated reproofs. He that being often reproved. Look what he says in verse 29, 1A. He that being often reproved, tokaka, is that phrase. And it means to constantly and continuously be convicted in your conscience or in your heart and your life by God. It means to repeatedly be rebuked or scolded in your heart and in your conscience and in your life by God. But you're not going to listen. It means to repeatedly be reprimanded, to be admonished by God in your conscience and in your heart and in your life. By God. Why? Because he's a cruel God? Of course not, beloved. Why does he do it? Because he's trying to arrest your attention and correct you of the impenitent sin or sins, but you've constantly and continuously refused to listen to his repeat, repeated reproofs. As a pastor, I have seen this happen thousands of times down through my years as a pastor. Christians harden in their heart, harden in their heart. Oh! I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I'm going to tell you what the, the literal Hebrew means uh, as I go along in my sermon here. But you see, beloved, the question is, have you done this? Are you like that in your life? Notice the word that begins with the pronoun he. He is the word ish. It refers to any and every stiff-necked person like this, especially the impenitent believers who constantly and continuously reject God's repeated reproofs to put away that besetting sin that does so easily beset them, beloved, that he's been convicting them of again and again and again. He puts somebody again and again and again. And all of a sudden, you start hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit like this. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. What have you done to your heart? You've hardened your heart. Solomon knows what he's talking about here, beloved. At the end of his life, nowhere does the Bible teach that he was ever saved. The wisest man on earth who God appeared to twice, spoke to him personally twice, but then he got carried away with women. Women, unsaved women. And they led him away, the Bible says, from the Lord God of Israel. And we look at the Hebrews Hall of Fame chapter. We don't see Solomon in there, do we? How unfortunate. That really is. Now, beloved, please listen to me. All of us are often reproved. All of us, me, you, all of us are often reproved and convicted by God. No one goes to hell unloved. No one goes to hell unwarned or unconvicted by God, but sadly only some will humble themselves and will hear and heed God's reproofs and repent and straighten out their lives. Most will just pay no heed. They'll continue on in their iniquities until the axe falls. And then, beloved, it'll be too late to repent. And then it'll be too late to change or to be sorry and be saved, beloved. You listen to me carefully, beloved. 
This is not just speaking about some unsaved drunk or drug addict in the street. This is not speaking about just some wicked or evil or incorrigible uh, person of this world. This is not just speaking about lost, the lost people of this world who could care less about their soul. In fact, beloved, most folks like that could care less about being reproved by God and they wouldn't even recognize it when they were reproved by God. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying, no sir, no ma'am. This is a dire warning in context. It's directed mainly to the children of Israel. Those who were God's people. Mainly directed to professing believers who say they know God's word, will, and ways. Mainly directed to those who claim that they're saved before the Lord, but still entrench themselves in their sin or wrong behavior or that wrong attitude or hard attitude in your heart, and they reject God's often reproofs. In other words, beloved, they just slough it off as though it's nothing. Ah, but it is. It is. Didn't Jesus say that in that day of judgment, every idle word that man speaks will give an account for it? Didn't he say that? Every idle word. As I've grown older as a man, as I've grown older as a Christian, as I've grown older as a pastor, I try to think about what I'm going to say before I say it. <laughs> I want to get the big foot out of my mouth. <laughs> That's Italian, by the way. <laughs> I try to think about what I'm saying before I'm saying it. How about you? As you grow as a Christian. So the question is this, beloved. How does God repeatedly speak to us? How does God repeatedly reprove us? How does God repeatedly convict us so we'll feel the guilt? So we'll feel the shame of our sin in our heart and in our conscience and repent and correct our wayward ways so we can re be restored back into his good grace, uh, graces. Well, the fact is, beloved, I wish I could give you all the ways, but I can't. But God does speak to us in many ways, but there's six primary ways that God has clearly shown us in Scripture how He speaks to us. And so I want to go over them on the point number one, beloved. Are you listening? I hope you're listening. God primarily speaks to us through, number one, the Holy Spirit. God speaks to us, number one, through the Holy Spirit. Listen to me now. In John 16, 8, Jesus said this, that He sent the Holy Spirit to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment so we could get saved and also so we could keep on being convicted of sin and of righteousness and of judgment and stay saved. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, when you're doing something wrong that you know you ought not to be doing and you feel guilty about it but won't fess up, that's the strong, still, small voice of the Holy Spirit bringing you under convictioning by whispering in your heart and in your conscience of your guilt and your need to get it right before it is too late. That's why St. John, the beloved, in 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess, that Greek word means if I agree with God, yes, I've done it. If I admit that I've done it. He'll cleanse me. He'll, he'll justify me. He'll sanctify me. Hey, if, on the condition now, what if I don't? Do I still have that benefit? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. How many unrighteousness? All of it. And we thank God for the sinless, shameless, guiltless, blameless, crimson blood of the Lord Jesus that washes us clean from our sins. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, if we refuse to hear and heed his constant and continuous reproofs and rebukes, then his heavy chastening hand will come upon us. And it comes upon us harder and harder till we make the final decision that either we're going to receive that reproof or reject it. And when we make that final decision before God, he'll seal it. Revelation 2, uh, 22, 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. In other words, it's irrevocable now. If Jesus were to appear right now, the state that we're in, all of us, we're the whole world. That's how we'll enter eternity. There's no more pleading before the bar of God. You see, beloved, if we repent, God will forgive us, and he'll correct us, and he'll bless us. But if we reject them, then God will stop reproving us, and now he'll also reject us. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 15, I don't know if I'm going to quote the whole thing, 
But he says, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons at all. If you do not get chastened by the things that you're doing, you're not a son of God. If it's a wrong thing that you're doing, amen? Furthermore, we have fathers of our flesh that corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much more uh, um, uh, submit ourselves unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily chastened us after their, their own pleasure. But he for our profit. Why? That we may be partakers of, he, of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them who are exercised thereby. Wherefore, he says, lift up the hands that hang down, and the feeble knees. Oh, gee whiz, you know. He says, lift them up. He says, and let that which is lame be turned out of the way, and let it be healed. He says, and then he goes on, beloved. He says, listen, don't let any root of bitterness develop in your heart. He says, because not only will defile you, but everybody else around you. A root of bitterness. And then you pass it on to someone else. Now they got jaundiced eyes, just like you have. I've seen that happen so often. People do once uh, friendly and loving and sweet in the church, all of a sudden because they had a problem with someone and they told this person, this person assumed their enemies. I always told my friends, I don't expect my friends to assume my enemies. If you get along with that person, good for you. Hallelujah. I don't want you not to like them because they don't like me. Not too many people like me anyway. <laughs> but I'm not here to be liked. I don't want to be offensive for being offensive. But you see, beloved, what I'm saying to you is this here. I plead with you this morning to listen to the precious voice of the Holy Spirit when he's trying to get you to convent. If he's, uh, repent. If he's convicting you of some sin in your heart, if he's convicting you of some bitterness or some resentment in your heart, if he's convicting you of some anger that you held on to and held on to and held on to, beloved, don't do it. Hear what the Spirit is trying to say to you through this preacher this morning. Are you listening? Do you hear what the Spirit has to say under the churches? I pray you can. Because God wants you to repent so he can prevent you from crossing the death line. Would you say amen? So God speaks to us, first of all, through the Holy Spirit. Secondly, God speaks to us through the Scriptures, the Holy Scriptures. That's why it's so important to read the Word of God. Amen? The Bible is God's verbally inspired Word to us. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and righteousness, that the man and woman of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good work. It is God-breathed. That's what the word pneuma there means, like pneumatic tires or pneumonia. That's where we get that from. It's verbally inspired the Word of God. It supernaturally enlightens our mind. It illuminates our hearts to the mind of the Lord and to His moral and spiritual principles and precepts that is revealed in His Word, will, and ways. Amen? Why? To convert us. Why? To consecrate us. Why does He do it, beloved? To change us. Why does He do it? To convict and correct us. Would you say amen out there? To convict and correct us. You see, what I'm saying is this. When the people of God... Read the Word of God and come to the church of God and hear the message from God, preached by the man of God, anointed by the Holy Spirit of God, then they need to repent before God if we're convicted of sin by God. Are you listening? Is God the Holy Spirit speaking in your heart and in your mind and in your conscience this morning? Only you can determine that. Beloved, if you're not listening, I want to tell you, listen to me now. You're rejecting the Holy Ghost. You're calling God a liar in the Scripture. And not to do this, or, or you're doing this, is to irreverently and irresponsibly disregard God's repeated reproofs to you to try and stop you from crossing His death line. He's trying to help you. He's trying to do all that He can. Number three, not only the Holy Spirit, not only the Scriptures, but the saints. The saints. God speaks to us through the saints. 
In other words, his faithful servants that he providentially puts in our path who are living holy and righteous and godly lives, who have the courage, who have the love, or they tell us the truth when we go astray. A lot of Christians love a person's love more than they, need the, uh, than they uh, do their soul. In other words, we tell them what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear. Parents do that with their children. They don't correct their children. They love their love more than they love what's good for the child. I've had to make, make some hard decisions in my life, but I've always told my wife, I will not prolong their suffering to protect mine. I won't pro- prolong their suffering to protect mine. So we need to be able to fess up. We need to be able to listen up when God puts his saints in our path, amen? And God puts them there, by the way, in our path to reprove us and correct us, beloved, in our impenitent sins or our ungodly and carnal ways because like them, they also care enough for your soul that they don't want you to cross this finish line. So they'll come up to you and say, listen, my brother, I love you, but i got to tell you this. You can't keep doing what you're doing. You know, in Galatians 6, 1, Paul speaking to the church at Galatia, and you know the, how they're trying to go, the Judaizers try to bring them back under the law. I don't have time to explain that to you. But Paul said this to them in Galatians 6, 1. He says, Brethren, if any man be overtaken in the fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Ye which are spiritual, not carnal, not the ones who get the logs in their eye trying to pick the splinter out of the other person's eye, but the person is taking the log out of their eye, and they can now, before God, without being a hypocrite, take that little splinter out of that person's eye. So, beloved, let me ask you something. Is some saint lovingly reproving you right now? You say, yeah, preacher, you. <laughs> So, beloved, is some servant of God, is some friend, is some family member lovingly reproving you right now before the Lord? Beloved, if so, can you receive it or do you get mad and huff and puff and rebuff and totally ignore it? In Proverbs 125, one of the first verses I ever memorized in my life, it says this, A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. Whenever I have a problem, I try to find somebody that knows more than me. Of course, that's impossible, but no, I'm only kidding. A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. Beloved, even when I want to complain, it's like in the military, you never complain down. You don't complain down to the ranks, you complain up to the officers, amen? If I want my men to follow me, then I have to be a leader. I can't complain down to them, and then they get that wrong attitude and and infectious fear in their heart and lose their courage to fight. So you complain up before God. And so if you don't have a friend who's honest enough to tell you the truth, beloved, then what you need to do is say, Lord, I need to find someone who will give me the wise counsel. Would you say that out there? So, beloved, does that sound like you? How do you respond when you're being often reproved? How do you respond? Now, number three and four, beloved, they kind of go together, they dovetail. I'm going to give it to you. It's sickness and sorrow. Now, let me give you a disclaimer first. This does not mean that all sickness and all sorrow is God's reproof and chastening hand upon us. Sin has everything to do with it in the world. The whole world has fallen, all right? We're breaking down. The curse... Of God is upon mankind, we're all going to die somehow, some way. But when we deviate from the Lord, beloved, and we live in sin, or we harbor sins in our heart and reject God's reproof, He indeed afflicts us with sickness and sorrow to hopefully correct us so we will get it right. Amen? For example, God afflicted the Israelites with sickness and sorrow to do this. God afflicted King Hezekiah, who was a great king, And yet, because he got a little bit puffed up with himself, God afflicted him, beloved. He ended up with boils on his body and had to put fig leaves on it. Remember when the prophet Isaiah came to him and get the pus out and to heal that infection. You know how painful the boil can be. And beloved, many Christians, we're going to take the Lord's table at Corinth. God says he afflicted a lot of them with sickness and death because they would not listen to what God had to say. And how about King David, beloved? 
In Psalm 119, 67, listen to what David said. David said, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Before I was with, afflicted, I went and did what I wanted to do, said what I wanted to say. I just went on my jolly way. But now that I've been afflicted, I've learned how to keep thy word. Nothing goes undone before the Lord. Would you say amen? In fact, in a few verses later, in Psalm 119.71, David came to a realization of something. He said, it's good that I've been afflicted. Why, David? That I might learn thy statutes. The word learn is a big Greek word, a Hebrew word. It means learn, to keep, not only just read it and know it in his mind intellectually, but to obey it, to keep it. And so, what am I saying to you? I'm saying God's reproofs of affliction are both corrective and they're protective for our souls. But beloved, you can't trifle with God. Instead, you need to tremble before God. The Bible says man trifles with God when he should be trembling before God. Amen? Number five, beloved. Another way God primarily speaks to us is through situations. Situations in life. Adversities in life. God regularly uses all kinds of difficult problems and trials and troubles and tribulations to often reprove us, to lovingly arrest our attentions, to drive those sins, those sinful behaviors out of our life. Like what, Pastor Joel? Well, beloved, read the scriptures. The Bible says he stirs up people. You know, listen to me, Tom, I'm going to stir up your sister to get mad at you, your brother, your cousin, your first... Like... Things like recurrent family problems. God stirs up things like friendship problems, or God stirs up problems at your job or personal problems in your life, beloved. Why does God do this? Because He hates you? No! Just the exact opposite. Because He does love you. He paid the redemption price on the cross for all mankind. Amen? And see, beloved, what I'm saying to you is this. He's trying to stop us from committing spiritual suicide by crossing His uh, death line in our life. And the sixth way, and this will be the last way on this, on the point number one, is sinners. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying frequently, when we repeatedly refuse to hear and heed God's often reproofs, He'll put unsaved people in our path. Why does He do that? Now listen to me. To dress us down, to scream and yell the reproof in our face. To both tell us off and tell it like it is, beloved, because they don't care if you like them or not, unlike your friend who's afraid to tell you the truth. You see, the Bible is replete with this. When the children of Israel stubbornly refused to listen to God's prophets, God sent them to the children of Israel. Tell them this. Tell them to repent. I'll forgive them. I'll bring them back. I'll correct them. I'll help them. I'll bless them again. But they've got to turn. And they went, ah, fooey, we don't care what you're saying. They turned their back on what God had to say. So God says, now I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to speak to you my reproofs through your enemies, those who ruthlessly and painfully persecute you, and they will bring you into captivity, and you'll go into the diaspora. That is, you'll be scattered throughout the world. By the way, that's why this Jewish community is throughout all the world today, because of the diaspora. Babylonian captivity, Assyrian captivity, the Roman captivity, sent them throughout all the world. That's why Paul always went to the synagogue first when he was preaching. Amen? It was already an established place there where he could go and preach the word of God and where they had the scrolls of God. You see, God now reproved them through their hated Assyrian and Babylonian enemies and their their hated Edomite and Moabite and Ammonite and especially their Philistine enemies. God says, you won't listen to me. In fact, uh, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14, when it talks about tongues, uh, and God says, with stammering lips and other tongues will I speak unto this people, and they will not hear me. What it's talking about is in the book of Isaiah, when the children of Israel wouldn't listen to what God had to say, God says, I'll tell you who you're going to listen to. You're going to listen to the Assyrians, and you won't even understand what they're saying. Well, you understand what they're doing to you. They're going to put you under the yoke. They're going to kill you. They're going to persecute you. They're going to take everything that you have. Then will you listen to me? Will you see that what I told you was indeed true, that it's come to pass now in your life? So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying, he'll tell you, okay, if you ask him. But the question is, will you humble yourself? Man's problem is his pride, isn't it? 
Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, about Satan. I don't have time to go there, but all that to say, beloved, he says, I will be like the Most High God. His pride. The Bible says all the children of pride are children of the devil. They have pride just like their father. Well, so what do we have? Number one, the serial reproofs. Number two, but, but I want you to see the stubborn rebellion. Look what he says in verse 1b, Proverbs 1 1b. He that be and often reproved, and then he says, hardeneth his neck, kashawo reth. And it means to repeatedly resist and ignore and disregard God's often reproofs and instead become stiff-necked and hard-hearted and rebellious toward them. <clears throat> Excuse me. That Hebrew word literally means this, to lift up the heel. <laughs> That's what it means. You know, just by me gesturing that, exactly what it means. Amen? You lift up the heel against God when he reproves you. I hope you say, no, preacher, not me. Beloved, does that sound like you? If so, I exhort you this morning to wake up. I exhort you to repent before it's too late because you could be in danger of losing your soul. Beloved, do you have, listen to me now, a humble, reachable, and teachable spirit? Or are you so stubbornly, so obstinately dug in, set in your own prideful ways and beliefs that you cannot be taught by anyone else in your life because you always think that you're right. You know, I have a board of presbyters, a corporation. The CEO will have his visors around them, and then they'll throw things out. They'll discuss it because God speaks through or there's men with more knowledge and wisdom than you, and your job as the CEO is to sift through it, see what makes the most sense, and then make the right decision. Amen? That's, the, that's why you have it. The board, we, we toss things around. And I've never made, you know that I've never really made, a, I've never voted in all the years. We talked about it, the board voted, and I said, I agree. <laughs> Except the one they said they needed to throw me out. I, I didn't agree with that. Beloved, are you such an overly sensitive and defensive person that you can't listen to others when they lovingly rebuke you? You say, Pastor, how do I know if I'm an overly sensitive and defensive type of person? Now, that's a good question, isn't it? Pastor, you're scratching me right where it itches. I'm trying to, because I love you. How do you know? The answer is easy. Can you receive reproof from others without getting angry? Can you? Can you receive correction and instruction from others without getting angry? Or do you lift up the heel? Can you receive conviction, beloved, from others without getting angry? Can you? Especially when deep down inside you know they're right in what they're uh, saying to you, but you're so stubborn and recalcitrant and rebellious that you refuse to humble yourself and admit you're wrong and repent, and instead when they speak to you, you're standing up on the outside, but you're sitting down on the inside and blocking your ears and hardening your heart. La, 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 I can't hear you. I made up my mind and I'm not going to change it. That's your problem, by the way. And below, your job is to prove me wrong. See if I'm wrong. I challenge you. See if I'm wrong. But you know if you read the scriptures that I'm right. Amen. Amen. The problem is a lot of mamby-pamby pussyfooting preachers who drink pink tea with their pink finger up and wear pink lace on their underwear I don't want to preach it. They got jello in their spine, Cal. <laughs> there was a time when they preached it, not anymore. There was a time when they preached it. You see, beloved, if you're like this, then you are indeed one of these type of people. You are one of these type of people who cannot receive reproof, you cannot receive rebuke, you cannot receive anything because you're too prideful. How could they be right and I be wrong? It was a song, something like that. Now you hear me, beloved. This text right here is one of the most frightening warnings in all of Scripture to folks like this. Now listen. When children refuse to listen to the commands and instruction of their parents, the frustrated parent, that fed up parent, will give them a final warning by saying like this. 
don't you make me say this again. My father would say, and then he'd go like this. He's not grabbing his belt, okay? Right across the face, Joel. And he'd take off the belt. He was an old Portuguese. <laughs> you are going to get it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, parents. Don't you make me say that again. Well, you know what, beloved? Likewise, the God of heaven and earth also says this to stiff-necked people who repeatedly and obstinately resist and they ignore and they disregard his constant and continuous reproofs in their lives to repent. And only now God says, be sure that I'll not say this to you again. Your parents might, but you cross the line now, and I won't say it to you. You see, beloved, God warns us in Scripture. Listen to me. Doesn't he say in the book of Numbers, be sure your sin will find you out? Doesn't God say that the way of the transgressor is hard? Doesn't he say that? Doesn't God say in Genesis 6, 3, my spirit will not always strive with man. Is he striving with you right now? Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord that he's still striving with you. Amen. Doesn't the scripture warn that we're to flee from the wrath to come? There's wrath coming, beloved. And we're starting to see some of the judgments on the world and on America itself right now by the hand of God. Look what's happening around you. That's how God judges nations. Study the Bible. That's how God judges nations, beloved, like we're going through right now. And by the way, we deserve it. I pray for this country every day, and I say, Lord, start with me. Get me to repent. Get me to turn. You know, it says, if my people shall call my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land uh, in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. But I say, Lord, start with me. It'd be like a throwing a stone in the pond. It goes bloop, and the ripples start going out. Because America, the church is weak. The church is sinning, beloved. The church is like the world. The church has the world's beliefs. They act like the world. You know, if, if this were the first and second centuries, the church of today would have never conquered the Roman Empire. Imagine, beloved, the, first, the church of the first and second century would willing to be fed the lions, have their skin peeled off them, being crucified on a cross, naked. And your natural instinct was to, is to cover up, and you can't now. Have two horses and pull your joints out. Your arms are about six feet long. And they said, I'm willing to die for my Lord Jesus. I'll not deny him. And so America needs to look up. Needs to look up. Amen. But you know, we don't think. We're, we're, we're looking to the politicians. Things are going to get better. I know, I know things will get it, beloved. There's no politician ever going to make it better. I, I, when I mean better, I mean the way it should be, okay? But a lot of Christians think God won't deal with us. But you know in Ecclesiastes uh, 8.11, the Bible says this. Listen. It says, because sentence against an evil work is not executed spe uh, speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Because the axe doesn't fall immediately, we say, oh, I got away with it. But I've told you the wheels of God's justice turn ever so slowly because he is merciful and kind. They grind ever so finely. When Jesus was born, the prophet Simon, Simeon in the temple, said, this man, this child is set for the rise and fall of many. If you fall on that stumbling stone, beloved, you will be converted and you'll be saved. But if that stumbling stone falls on you, you'll be utterly damned forever. He's set for the rise and fall of many in Israel, slash the world. So, beloved, are you a stubborn rebel? Are you stiff-necked and hard-hearted? Do you refuse to listen to God's often reproofs to you through others? You know, the Bible says this in Proverbs 27, 6, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. The Bible says this, beloved, in Proverbs 12, 1, He that hateth reproof is brutish. In other words, that Hebrew word means you're like a brute animal. The Bible says in Proverbs 10, 17, He is in the way of life that keeps instruction, but he that refuses reproof, he errs, he greatly errs. So are you crossing God's death line in your life because you will not listen 
to the reproofs, you become a stubborn rebel. Number three, beloved, not only the serial reproofs, the stubborn rebellion, but I want you to see the sudden ruination. Look what he says in Proverbs 29.1, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed. Let me stop you right there. Oh, what a sober and what a serious warning that is. The word suddenly be destroyed, pathera, shavar, it means to instantly and unexpectedly. It means without warning be shattered into pieces and shivers. Now listen to what the Hebrew word means. Like a broken and smashed pot that can never be glued back together and fixed. Smithereens. You know what I'm talking about. I remember one time I got a flower for my wife. I said, honey, look at it. I said, oh, Joe, I love it. And I dropped it on the driveway. I salvaged the flower. I repotted it, but the, the vase was gone. <laughs> Meaning, beloved, those impenitent folks who constantly and con- dis- c- continually resist and refuse God's often reproofs, and they resist and refuse his repeated counsel and correction and conviction, beloved, will suddenly and unexpectedly and without warning someday be utterly shattered to pieces and destroyed by the punitive judgment hand of God. In other words, beloved, They'll be going about their business as usual, not thinking about anything, because they don't remember what they did before the Lord. And they don't remember all the times they've shuffed off his, his, off his reproofs. They'll be going about their little business, then boom, some sudden calamity will befall them. Boom, some sudden tragedy or disaster will befall them. Then boom, some sudden uh, uh, affliction will befall them, beloved. They've been sent by God to now destroy them forever because they rep- Refuse his repeated reproofs, beloved, and mistakenly thought that crossing his deadline or death line was impossible for them to do in their life. Listen to me now. The Bible repeatedly warns that we are to walk circumspectly. Paying attention to what's going on, right? Being mindful, aware. Right? We're to walk circumspectly. A lot of people say, well, I think about God when I come to church, and that's it. But now if you're a Christian, beloved, and dwelt by the Holy Ghost, that's not it, is it? You can't do that. You've got to walk circumspectly. Now, I know the, the God that they're portraying on TV and the God that lets you do everything you want to do and this God of love and everybody's... Uh, just It's sickening, beloved, when you see it. And that's why these people are still having the problems in their life because they won't get it right and they're still under the convicting hand of God. And he's trying to chase them to get them right. And they're running to psychologists and psychiatrists. <laughs> the old church didn't do that. You know what they did? They studied the Word of God. And they started putting God's principles into action in their life. And guess what? Their life got cleaned up. And their mind got better. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't go to a psychiatrist. I go every day because I was crazy once. <laughs> you see, beloved, and... I want you to hear the word of the Lord. In Psalm 50, verse 22, God wants this. Now, this is what God says. He says, Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver you. Indeed, in Proverbs 1, 26, God says this. He says, I will also laugh at your calamities, and I will mock you when your fear cometh. Why? Because you didn't listen to me. You laughed at me, so now I'm laughing, laughing at you. The Apostle Paul, in Galatians 6, 7, and 8. The church of Galatia, Gentiles, indoctrinated in the Greek philosophies, Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, the intelligentsia of the world. And of course the Greeks taught that the body was unimportant. You could do whatever you wanted to do with the body. It was a prison house for the soul. All that mattered was your soul. But the Bible says God redeems his body, soul, and spirit. Amen? And he warns us what to do in our bodies and what not to do in our bodies. But Paul said this to them in Galatians 6, 7, and 8. He says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap Life everlasting. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Amen. Are you sowing to the Spirit or to the flesh this morning? 
What are you sowing to? You can't mock God. You can mock yourself. You know, you try to convince yourself when you've done something wrong and his conscience is screaming at you. Well, I had every right to do that. This is what they said to me. <laughs> uh, why don't you just fess up and get it right? Huh? Just get it right. Good night. No big thing. Just part of life. Get it right. You see, what I'm saying to you, beloved, is this. Today, we live in a time of very effeminate, Me Too movement, carnal, politically correct, woke Christianity, where such warnings like this fall on deaf ears. We've created a God of our own choosing. See, God is now this white-bearded old man up in the sky, an innocuous, uh, toothless, defanged tiger, who doesn't judge anyone, he loves everyone, he cares for everyone, and he certainly brings everyone to heaven. Isn't that the God that's being painted today in a lot of your Christian ministries? Beloved, that's a half-truth. Paul said he was ordained to preach the whole truth of God. I tried to do that to you. I preach you the good, bad, and the ugly. <laughs> because you know what? I preached to myself first, because I needed as much as you. What am I saying to you? I'm saying, yet, beloved, even though people believe in a God like this, yet God drowned all the impenitent people of Noah's day. Why? Because they crossed his death line. Yet God, beloved, destroyed proud Pharaoh and all the Egyptians. Why? Because they crossed God's death line. Yet God killed the high priest Eli, beloved, and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Why? Because they crossed God's deadline. He says, you will not do that in the house of God. And Eli started off a great high priest. And yet God turned, turned Lot's wife into the greatest, biggest salt shaker there was, a pillar of salt. Remember, the angels delivered her out of Sodom. And God says, don't look back. And she did, poof. And God says to you when he delivers you from the world, what? Don't look back. Am I right? You'd be a pillar of salt. Yet God damned King Ahab of Israel and his hussy wife Jezebel. God damned Judas, uh, uh, Iscariot, beloved. He damned him to hell because they crossed God's finish line. And you know what, beloved? God even sent and allowed his son to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins because man had crossed his death line. You know, God says in the scripture, I am a great God. God says, I am the divine judge of heaven and earth. God says, I am the divine avenger. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. So God's no one to trifle with, is he? Beloved, let me give you point number four, very short, because it needs no explanation. Number four, the sobering result. He that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall subtly be destroyed, in part D there, and he says that without remedy. And that without remedy. That Hebrew phrase, marpe, means that the final and disastrous outcome of of crossing God's death line, now note this, beloved, this penalty, is eternally fatal and irremediable. It means it's eternally irreversible, and that person has now become irredeemable. God drew the line, see? It means that it's eternally terminal and immutable. It's unchangeable, beloved. In other words, the punitive result for crossing God's death line never ends. So I exhort you this morning, don't you do it. And that you includes me too. Don't you do it. Beloved, listen and learn from God's reproofs. Don't ignore them or disregard them. Don't harden your hearts. Don't be stiff-necked lest you cross that point of no return, as I said right from the outset. There's a limit. In professional sports, football, out of bounds. Anything in bounds, good. Out of bounds, doesn't count, right? God sets limits. God sets limits in our life. And God says within those limits, you're free. 
and you're happy and joyful and I'll take care of you and I'll forgive you and I'll bless you and I'll give you eternal life. I'll give you all of that. But I warn you, don't step outside them. Because not only will the de devil get a hold of you, but I will. Let me leave you this, beloved. God doesn't want any person in this world saved or unsaved. Backslider to ever cross his death line. I don't know where that line is and neither do you. But I take it serious enough to preach to you folks so you can preach it to your children or your grandchildren because there is a line and remind them of that. Mama and daddy may say, don't you do that again. Don't make me say it one more time. But God the Father says, I'm sure that you've crossed the line and I won't say it again. Crossing God's death line. Let's go to the Father.